the issue is that our satellite needs to charge its batteries. So it's obviously got solar panels on it and we, we put the satellite in front of the sun a lot of the time to charge the batteries. The problem there is that the satellite itself becomes warm and a source of infrared radiation. And this is one of the sources of information that you don't care about. So you basically cool the detector image on the dark side of the Earth where the sun is less of a, where it's not obviously warming the satellite anymore. Welcome to another episode of the Mapscaping Podcast. My name is Daniel and this is a podcast for the geospatial community. My guest on the show today is Robin Cole. Robin is a senior data scientist at a company called Satellite View. And today on the podcast, we're talking about thermal imagery from space. Before we get started today, I want to point you towards an initiative between GeoAwesomeness and Up42. Together, these two organizations are creating something called the EO Hub, so the Earth Observation Hub. It's hosted on GeoAwesomeness. There'll be a link to it in the show notes of this episode. But if you search for GeoAwesomeness slash EO Hub, you, you'll find it as well. And the Earth Observation Hub is a collection of resources focused on, you guessed it, Earth Observation. So at the moment, you can filter these resources by data source, spatial resolution, data type, sector, technology. But this is constantly evolving and it'll be well worth stopping by to check it out. Again, Geo Awesomeness, Earth Observation Hub. There'll be a link to it in the show notes of this episode. Hey Robin, welcome to the podcast. Let me try a brief introduction here. So you are a senior data scientist at a company called Satellite View. And I was just in looking at your LinkedIn profile. And do you know what it says at the top of your own LinkedIn profile at the moment? Oh, God. <laughs> what does it say? Tackling the world's biggest challenges with AI and ML applied to aerial and satellite imagery. <laughs> that, that's exactly right. That's what it says at the top of your LinkedIn profile. Would you mind just briefly introducing yourself to the audience, please, and telling us how you got involved in tackling the world's biggest problems in AI, ML, in satellite and aerial imagery? Absolutely. So. My background is in physics. I did an undergraduate and a PhD in optical physics, and I've worked in a number of R&D research roles since you know, leaving academia. A couple of years ago, I was working at a company called Surrey Satellites, who actually make uh, Earth observation satellites, and I started to get more into, involved in the analytics of the imagery that those satellites are capturing. And over time, that's pretty much where my, my passion and my focus has been directed. Currently, I'm a senior data scientist at Satellite View, and we're actually launching a satellite that is currently being built by Surrey Satellites. And it's going to be a unique kind of satellite in that it's capturing thermal imagery. Outside of work, I'm also active in the open source and knowledge communities, particularly around machine learning applied to satellite and aerial imagery. And I maintain a popular repository which collects and lists all the uh, resources on that topic. In terms of tackling the world's biggest challenges, uh, what we're doing at Satellite View is all around uh, understanding energy use and the built environment. So we know that we're using way too much energy and creating lots of emissions as a result of that. And so the problem that we want to help tackle is identifying where we're wasting energy and how changes can be made effectively to reduce uh, that wastage. Also, through my open source work, I'm helping to educate everyone, I think, around how machine learning can be applied to satellite imagery to solve a very wide range of challenges, everything from uh, identifying uh, floodwaters through to monitoring fires, through to quantifying change to the, the land use and the surface of the earth. So I, I think that, that uh, backs up the, the statement. <laughs> <laughs> yeah, I think so. There's, there's a lot to dig into there. Um, I, I want to go back to this uh, optical physics. Could you just explain to me what that is? What, what is optical physics? So Earth observation satellites, the ones that are capturing RGB images, they have very large telescopes on the front. Telescope design was one of the topics I studied in my master's year. And what I was doing at Surrey Satellites was all around the alignment of telescopes and the calibration of telescopes. Obviously, when you, a telescope is quite a delicate object and you have to do quite a lot of careful work to basically glue everything in place before it's launched on a rocket into space. And part of the work I was doing at Surrey Satellites is all around how do you automate the alignments and verification of these optical systems. So that, that sounds like a long way away from working on thermal imagery. A am I right? Or is there some kind of overlap here that, that, that I'm not seeing? Because my understanding is that Satellite View is, is going to be launching a, a thermal imaging sensor on, onto a satellite. That's right. So the actual telescope on the thermal imaging satellite is actually very similar to the telescope that's on RGB satellites. The main difference, well, apart from 
the behavior of the mirrors they're optimized for different wavelengths is the main difference is the detector technology that's used so on our thermal imaging satellite we're using a detector that uh, measures radiation in the midwave infrared band which is around four microns and it's a special kind of detector because of the essentially the low amount of radiation at those wavelengths you have to cool the detector to minimize the effect of sort of spurious thermal signals uh, in the system. So they're actually very similar, optical and thermal satellites, but the detector technology is quite different. I just want to ask a follow-up question there. You said to cool the detector. So there's some sort of coolant on board on the satellite. Isn't space relatively cold? Can't we use space to cool down the detector? Yeah, that's, that's correct. Space is one of the coldest places that we know about. The issue is that our satellite needs to charge its batteries. So it's obviously got solar panels on it and we we put the satellite in front of the sun a lot of the time to charge the batteries. The problem there is that the satellite itself becomes warm and a source of infrared radiation. And this is one of the sources of information that you don't care about. So you basically cool the detector image on the dark side of the earth where the sun is less of a, where it's not obviously warming the satellite anymore and take all the steps you possibly can to minimize the spurious sources of radiation that would be impacting an image. Well, we're, we're a couple of minutes into this episode and we've come a long way. <laughs> so It's deep already. <laughs> yeah, yeah we're, we're, we've jumped in really deep. I, I, I want to back this up a little bit because my understanding is that you haven't launched at this, this thermal imaging satellite yet. What do you do? Like at Satellite View, are people just sitting around waiting for, the, for the, the satellite to be launched into space so they can start doing some testing? What are you doing in the meantime? Uh, so the, the first satellites are going to go up uh, next year. We'll have two in 2023 and then three in 2024 and another three in 2025. So we'll have a total of eight. In the meantime, what we're doing, we're capturing imagery on a plane and we've been flying uh, surveys over the UK and also North America. And what we're doing is demonstrating the uses of this, this kind of imagery and obviously building up all the backend infrastructure for handling uh, the imagery so that when our satellites go live next year, we'll be able to immediately provide uh, images via a web portal to, to paying customers. And uh, d- does thermal imagery, does it have a lot of the same limitations as what we might see with, with optical imagery? So I'm thinking about clouds, for example, shadows, that kind of thing. So it's got different characteristics. Uh, we're looking at a different part of the, the spectrum. And what we're looking at is the, the radiation emitted by warm objects. So one thing you can immediately do with thermal imagery is image in the night, which you obviously can't do very effectively with a, an RGB telescope. And you're probably familiar with seeing uh, those wildlife shows where they sort of show a, a leopard in the bush somewhere in the nighttime. Uh, those images are captured with uh, the same sort of technology that we're using. So it does have different qualities uh, in terms of smoke and cloud. So cloud does still block thermal radiation, but we do have the capability to look through certain kinds of cloud. So in particular, fires kick up lots of sort of sooty ash cloud, and this is very small particles, and the thermal radiation can actually penetrate through those. So one of the things we can do, which you can't do with optical RGB, is image fires through the smoke that they're producing. So that's a very unique capability. Just in that particular use case, are we talking about like sensing the, the thermal radiation given off by the, the dust particles in the cloud, or are we looking through that to the ground and sensing the, the, the thermal radiation being emitted by the surface of the Earth? Yes. So, I mean, warm clouds do appear slightly warmer than just obviously background air, but in the case of a fire, you'll quite clearly see the extent of a fire, obviously focused on its you know, densest point. And that's quite useful if you want to be able to track where a fire front is moving in terms of you need to alert people on the ground uh, where the fire is moving and where it is most significant, which would be very challenging optical RGB telescopes. I was just thinking, I asked you before about a shadow. So in, in optical imagery, you know, there's a shadow and it can be difficult to sort of figure out like, okay, where does this object stop? Where does it start if it's in a shadow? I'm assuming this is not a problem as such with, with thermal imagery. I, I'm guessing because it doesn't really matter how the sun's illuminating the surface. Uh, am I right? So. In daytime, you do see shadow effects because there actually is some sunlight that is imaged by the detector at the the midwave infrared. When we look at nighttime, typically shadows actually, they they check, you know, obviously they're blocking sunlight on a surface so that uh, an area that's been in shadow can appear slightly cooler than the surrounding areas. 
So if you're Im imaging immediately after uh, the sun has gone down, you will see some subtle effects due to where land had been shadowed before. But usually what we'd be doing is imaging basically in the dead of night where those effects would be uh, dissipated and you wouldn't actually see the influence of shadows anymore. And in terms of the measurements that, that you're making, are we talking about relative temperature within each scene or are we talking about absolute temperature of, of the surface that you're looking at? Initially, we're going to be, all of our images will be relative by default. So you'll be able to say uh, this area of the image is five Kelvin warmer than this area of the image over here, say. Our long-term goal is to move to absolute measurements. So we'll be able to give you a very precise temperature reading of a surface. That's currently something that we're developing. So at launch, the images will all be relatively scaled. I'm imagining you're going to need some sort of context. This is you know, what it is that we're looking at. And I guess in my mind anyway, context could come from imaging a area repeatedly and understanding how its thermal signature changes throughout time and obviously the environment that it's in as well. Or context could perhaps come from other data sets, maybe optical imagery where you see, okay, I've got a bright spot here in my thermal imagery. I go in and have a look at some RGB imagery and go, oh, that's a factory, that, that's, a, that's a pipeline, that's, that's a road. Is that the kind of thing that you're doing to sort of gain context around the things that you are being captured within each scene? Yeah, that's absolutely correct. So we're imaging with a detector that has a resolution of about three and a half meters, so kind of mid-range resolution. And typically what we'll do is overlay the thermal image onto high resolution RGB image. So you can obviously understand, okay, that heat signature is associated with that uh, chimney stack over there. So absolutely, we use them in combination with other imagery sources. So we often talk about spatial resolution, and I think sometimes people get, get lost in this idea. Do you think spatial resolution is a good proxy for quality of imagery or quality of data? It's definitely the most talked about sort of metric regarding image quality, but it's not, obviously not the only one. So typically there are trade-offs. If you have very high resolution, then you typically need a very large telescope and a large satellite to, to capture that, that image. Where we've gone with three and a half meters, it actually allows us to have a, a smaller satellite. It's about the size of a dishwasher. Uh, it's 150 kilograms. So it's relatively small by, by satellite terms. The other sort of factors that you care about is how much of the earth you're imaging at any one time and we'll be capturing around three and a half to four and a half kilometer images and the other factor that you care about is the the contrast in your image and one of the things that's very nice about the mid-wave infrared is that you get very strong contrast for objects which are sort of in the ballpark range of, sort of 50 degrees celsius to 100 degrees celsius and we shall be able to measure quite accurately the precise temperature of objects in that in that temperature range so if, if I go back to my university days, I remember sitting in a remote sensing class and I think the rule of thumb that, that we were given back then was that I can see an object that's four times the size of the, the resolution, the spatial resolution of, of the imagery that I'm working with. Is that correct? I think that is to do with uh, the sampling frequency. So I guess the question is, is there a rule of thumb which applies for thermal imagery? I think the answer to that is it's a little bit more complex just because of the nature of a thermal signal. The amount of radiation that's emitted is a function of the temperature of that object, and it is not a totally linear function. So an object that is, say, smaller but significantly hotter than the background would be visible, whereas an object that's maybe larger but at a lower temperature, you might struggle a little bit. So it's, it's a little bit more complicated than the, the rule of thumb that you quoted earlier on. But hopefully that gives you a flavor of how these images behave. Yeah, no, 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 I, I really appreciate that. I'm guessing too, like the thermal, uh, an object emitting radiation, that would also warm up the area around that as well. Is that something that you see or perhaps struggle with when you're trying to identify objects within thermal imagery? You definitely see a kind of halo effect. So if you're looking at a building and somebody has the windows open, you, you sort of see a halo effect around the open windows where I guess the air is slightly warmer there. So it's not exactly like with optical where a very small object would be impossible to image because it's below the resolution limit of that structure. You could have an object that's smaller than, say, the resolution of three and a half meters that our sensor has. But actually, if it's very hot, you would still actually see the presence of it. So if we, if we think about use cases for this now, I think you've done a great job of sort of walking us through how this imagery behaves and, and what kinds of features and, and 
the kinds of things we should be thinking about when we're processing it and what we might get out of it again. What, what are the applications of this? Obviously, we can see where energy is being lost, I, I'm guessing. I, I'm pretty sure that earlier in the conversation, you talked about focusing on the, the built environment. So I'm wondering if you can give us some ideas of use cases. Where, where do you think this is going to be used and what do you think it's going to be used for? Absolutely. So we know that, for example, in the UK, there's lots of old properties and uh, they're very thermally inefficient. They don't have insulation in the roof or they've got single pane windows and they're basically using a lot of energy which you know we would like to save the problem for you know the government or property owners is to identify these properties to begin with and to understand the the sort of scale of the problem and also where limited resources should be focused for for making interventions because modernizing and upgrading buildings is a very expensive business so that's one of the, the key use cases that we see. Other use cases are around basically monitoring of infrastructure. So one of the things during the, the COVID pandemic, we know lots of factories shut down and there was a general economic slowdown, but that would be very difficult to objectively quantify. And one of the characteristics of thermal imagery is that you can actually tell what's going on maybe inside of a structure, whereas an optical image would just show you the building, like the roof is there. With a thermal, you actually get an indication of what's actually going on inside. Is that factory operational? Potentially even what kind of processes are taking place? So if you have like chemical manufacturing processes where you could identify specific temperatures being related to specific processes, you would get a bit of an insight into what's actually being produced in a location. Uh, other areas, uh, applications that we're looking at are around understanding, understanding the impact of temperature on uh, the built environment and the inhabitants of that environment. So one of the other areas we're looking at is around characterizing uh, urban heat islands, which is basically an effect where densely constructed areas trap lots of heat. And you'll see this over big cities and in downtown areas. They can be you know, five to 10 degrees warmer than areas further away from the center of, of a town. And what we know is that these high temperatures are associated with deaths and obviously poor living conditions for the people that are in them. And this is a situation that's only going to get worse with uh, climate change. And what we really want to do is to be able to identify these locations, quantify the magnitude of the effects there, and advise on where interventions should be taking place, and also quantifying the impact of changes to the environment. I, I want to come back to the urban heat island effect in just a minute. But first, I want to go back to what we are talking about earlier with the, the the built environment, we're talking about inefficiency in terms of insulation in, in homes. I think the example was over in England. And I, I guess for that use case, how are you going to decide whether the building is inefficient because of design or because of use? That's a very good question. So, I mean, one of the things that I've learned personally is that you can have a very modern, efficient building that is used in a very inefficient way. I've had this experience myself in, a, in an office that was pretty much brand new. Uh, it was very nicely heated and insulated, but everybody found it too stuffy and they opened the windows and let all the heat out. So as you say, it can be difficult to know if it's by design or by use. But regardless, you want to identify those locations uh, to begin with. So that that is the step that we can obviously assist with. And then once you've actually done some measurements, you can probably move further along the chain to understand, you know, is this an issue with that building or is it about the way it's actually being used? Okay, so this is about narrowing the field by the sounds of it. Okay, where does the imagery say that we have energy loss, uh, essentially? And then I guess you could start your inspections there or start the detective process there. So, okay, well, why is this appearing brighter on our imagery? Oh, because people are leaving the windows open because, or because of, there isn't enough insulation in the roof. So if we go back to the urban heat island effect, so lots of people are focusing on this because this is a, a really big deal and there's lots of... I don't want to say interventions, but people are thinking about how they can mitigate the, the effects of this, this urban heat island. So we, think, we see things like planting more trees in urban environments, perhaps uh, painting roads white. I, I think this is an example that you gave me the last time we talked in this, this idea of creating green roofs. Is this something that, that you're hoping or will be able to test with thermal imagery? Let, let me give you an example. Let's say New York was painted a street white, as an example. Could you just monitor that over time and see the effect of that? And then report back to them, say, yes, it's working. No, no, it's not. Absolutely. So many of the kind of practical interventions people will be taking will be quite localized in nature. You know, you won't be painting two square kilometers white, obviously, but you might be painting 
know, the most significant roofs in an area, why or creating more green areas. And you're going to need relatively high resolution to be able to identify and see and track the changes at those, those locations. So where we've gone with three and a half meters, it gives you that kind of resolution where you can image those structures, but also get a, a decent overview of you know the surrounding area as well. Do you have to go to an area like that and do any sort of ground truthing or would it be enough just to see some you know, relatively high resolution aerial imagery, satellite imagery and say, okay, yep, that's white, that's a tree, that roof is green and undertake your monitoring from there? Well, we're really getting into the science of it now because there's different kinds of measurements people do. They, they can measure the air temperature and actually what we're going to be doing is measuring the surface temperature because it's the surface that's uh, emitting the radiation. So I think to get back to your question, you know, what kind of complementary measurements would we tie in with our own data? I think for sure we would be looking also at air temperature measurements. But what we know is that those kind of measurements, they're, they're, they're performed at you know, very point locations. And they don't necessarily give you the bigger picture of what's going on an area. So I, what I'm thinking is that it's the complementary nature of the two data sets, which is really going to deliver the greatest insights into what's actually going on in an area. Earlier, we were talking about monitoring infrastructure, and, and I think that the thing was that uh, a strong thermal signature or a lot of heat loss coming out of a building, for example, might be an indicator of economic activity. I, I'm wondering if we could see things like liquid or material moving through a pipeline, for example. I'm assuming if we had enough material moving through a pipeline, that there might be some sort of thermal change associated with that movement. Could, could you imagine monitoring uh, pipelines, oil pipelines, gas pipelines, that, that kind of thing? Absolutely. I think there's certainly going to be a lot of interest in monitoring uh, those kind of locations. You know, obviously has quite significant uh, economic and financial impacts. And there's lots of people that study these these locations intensely uh, using a variety of methods. And what you do, you definitely, I've seen in our imagery is that you can see when a pipe is full of a hot liquid, the whole thing is much warmer. And, you know, that's quite clear. And there are quite a lot of processes where liquids change temperature as they're moving through a, you know, a processing process or refinery. And actually understanding the status of those liquids is also has uh, lots of insight value. I think the elephant in the room when we talk about this kind of thing might be military applications. Um, I, I could imagine quite a few myself. Is that something that you and Satellite View will be focusing on? It's not something that I personally am involved in. Obviously, there are military applications for all kinds of uh, remote sensing imagery. It's kind of obvious that if you've got a thermal imaging capability and there's stuff going on at nighttime somewhere that it would have lots of utility in that, that situation. So not something I'm actually too involved in, but I mean, obviously that will be <laughs> a custom for our data there. Another example you mentioned in, in a previous conversation was solar farms. Could, could you walk me through that example again, please? Yeah, that's right. So we know we're going to need more renewable forms of energy and solar farms are being installed all over all over the world. And it's not always obvious, you know, where a solar farm should be located or even what the impact is of installing a solar farm. So there's been some interesting studies out there that have shown that actually if you put large solar farms into an area, you can even change the, the microclimate in the area. But those studies tend to be quite uh, sort of localized. So it should be really interesting to actually do, you know, more systematic and widespread surveys of those of those sites. Solar farms themselves, they they age over time and they develop issues. And it's typical that thermal imaging is used to identify some of the issues which can reduce the performance of solar panels. So they they get cracks and the other defects occur. And typically, this is identified through thermal imaging. So potentially, that is uh, something that we'll be able to do with our satellite as well. That's really interesting. I remember the first time you told me this, I was because initially I just thought, yeah, solar farms, great. We're, you know, how much sun, how much energy is falling on this piece of, of, of the world kind of thing? Is it a good place to put a solar farm? But what you're saying is that in theory, you can use this to study the microclimate that the solar farm will affect because you're, you're effectively changing a huge surface area. And, and that'll obviously have an effect on the, the climate with, within that environment and also the maintenance of these solar panels. That's right. So Currently, the way it works is that if you own a large solar farm, every I think every year or every six months, you, you hire somebody to fly a plane or a drone over that solar farm and look for potential issues there. Uh, that is quite a, a costly process. So potentially, if you, we can image those same locations with a satellite much more cheaply, that will actually really help improve the frequency of monitoring and catch issues earlier. Perhaps I should have asked this earlier on in the conversation, but these satellites that Satellite View is going to, to launch into space, 
are they going to be geostationary satellites or orbiting satellites? So these are orbiting satellites. And the plan is once we've got the full constellation of eight satellites, we will be able to revisit any location within certain latitudes uh, up to twice twice per hour. So that's the capability we're, we're planning for in, in 2025. Twice an hour. That that's, sounds I- I- incredible. But obviously, like I think you also said earlier on in the conversation that the optimal time would be in the middle of the night for, for actually imaging these areas. Yeah. So typically when people are doing thermal surveys, actually it varies, right? So for solar farms, you image during the daytime because... At night, they're cold and nothing's happening. So you want a daytime service for the solar farm. But if you're looking at uh, inefficient thermal structures, you typically survey at the nighttime because well, that's the nighttime is when you get the best contrast between the cold background and the warmth coming off, off the buildings. So different use cases will probably be prioritized at different times of, of the day. So, so with these relatively high uh, revisit times, revisit rates, when do you imagine that you have like this really significant database where you'll be able to see meaningful change over time so we're already capturing a fair amount of imagery on the plane uh, in terms of meaningful change over time i guess that probably depends on precisely what you're looking for some meaningful change happens on very short time scales say we were talking about a fire for example whereas other changes you know maybe a seasonal or even longer term annual trends so i think that really varies i mean once we've got eight satellites up i think we'll have a pretty decent that catalogue of imagery already at that point. So it's really hard to answer that question with any level of detail. I guess what I was going after was that idea of meaningful change and perhaps over like a sustained time period or longer periods of time. We're talking about seasonal change, for example. The, these things, in my mind anyway, would be really difficult to pick up with just snapshots here and there. But like if you were constantly revisiting a certain scene and looking at it, I, I guess maybe it would take a year, maybe it would take two years before you had a a significant sort of understanding of, okay, this is how this object behaves on a weekly, monthly, yearly sort of cycle. Yeah, I think that's totally correct. So I think right, right now, thermal imaging from space is using either MODIS or Landsat, and they're both fantastic uh, images, but they have relatively coarse resolution and very infrequent revisits. So, you know, you obviously would end up interpolating over big time differences there. And as as we've already said, you know, some changes, they can be very sort of temporal uh, and short term in their nature so you need that constellation i think that's the trend we're seeing overall in the earth observations industry with companies like planet launching large constellations because we recognize that it's the revisit rate that is actually important for understanding uh, processes i think you mentioned modus and landsat there um could you give me an idea of of what their spatial resolution is in terms of the the thermal imagery that they produce today yeah, I think MODIS is captured at 100 meters and resampled to 30 meters, and Landsat is at kilometer resolution. So quite a different magnitude from a three and a half meter resolution imagery we're going to capture. Yeah, absolutely. So clearly, this is a difficult problem to solve. Otherwise, I'm assuming people might have done it before. Is there something that's changed in their technology recently that's made it more more, more feasible to do this to create this kinds of center and put it into space or is there something changed in terms of the the business cases that are perhaps the business opportunities today where, where has the change been do you think yeah i think actually in, in both in both the technical and well, sort of economic side and also the you know, business cases i think historically these midwave infrared detectors were limited to sort of military and government clients but that, that has changed in the last couple of years and correspondingly the technology is also come down in price. The other thing that's obviously changed in the industry is the cost of launches. We're using SpaceX, who are have known to have massively reduced the cost of uh, getting satellites into orbit. And this has enabled people to uh, venture capital to fund activities that would have been you know, unfeasible uh, a decade ago. So I think it's a combination of the technology and sort of legislative changes and you know, the business case being there. So this all sounds amazing, right? Like, so you've got this amazing piece of technology. You've got the the technology change. So, so now it's cheaper, easier, faster to to launch these kinds of platforms into space. Uh, we talked about the we've got venture capital, so we can we can do we can try these kinds of things. In your mind, does it still feel like a risky business to be in, like a a, a risky business to start or or be involved with, or is it clear that the, this is going to work? I think with risk comes opportunity. So, you know, we're the first people to be putting up high resolution thermal imagery from space. And naturally, we're kind of breaking new ground in discovering what the, you know, the most valuable commercial applications are. 
for that imagery. And you know, it might be that 10 years from now, there are more constellations imaging in the thermal as well. And honestly, it's just really exciting to be working on a new kind of technology and asking those kind of fundamental questions like what is the best use for this data and what changes can we affect with it? What's been the most exciting bit of this process for you personally? So you've got this, this background in machine learning and in, in AI and you, you understand optical physics. So you've been working on telescopes before and you've been working at this company for is it almost two years now. What's been the most exciting bit for you personally, being involved in this project? Yeah, I, I felt like I was almost born and raised for this role in some ways. Like obviously, I've got the background in physics and uh, optical imaging and a passion for the, the coding and the analytics side as well. And all of those skills have, and experience have come to bear in the last uh, I think 18 months or two years I've been in the business now. So it's been a very personally fulfilling role to be able to bring all those elements together. It's also been really exciting to see a team and a company grow. So I joined as the first hire on the tech team and I think now we're like 20 people and it's, it's been a real whirlwind roller coaster ride to get to this point. Lot, lots of uh, hiring and meeting new people and lots of innovation happening on the technical side as well. So it's just been really enjoyable. It's been great to get really stuck into the image analysis side as well. Like I, I mentioned, I did, did a bit of that when I was working on the at Surrey Satellite several years ago, but that's pretty much my day job now is working on the analysis of the imagery and that's been very satisfying so yeah uh, just a couple of questions about the analysis of the imagery so we talked before about you know, the fact that the, the satellites aren't launched yet so you're flying your sensor around on planes what kind of adjustments are you going to have to make to to the models that you're working on to the analysis that you're doing when you start getting imagery from space how is that going to be different from the imagery that you're collecting from planes today yeah, so the imagery we're capturing from planes, obviously a plane is much closer to the Earth and it's much higher resolution. Typically, actually, we resample the images to be uh, sort of one meter resolution from the plane. So it's not, it's not all that different, but there are obviously different characteristics. And we know roughly what to expect when the uh, satellite is in orbit in terms of the optical and the, the qualities of the imagery. And uh, you know, a fair amount of the, my work of the last year and a half has been on understanding the significance of any potential changes uh, to the imagery. Machine learning itself obviously requires reasonably large data sets of training data. So what we're doing is actually capturing these data sets using the plane and demonstrating, yeah, we can do this, we can do that with machine learning on that, that kind of imagery. And then the idea will be once we have the satellite imagery to do a sort of transfer learning approach where you've already pre-trained a model on imagery that's been captured on the plane, and can then just fine tune it on the imagery from the satellite. So earlier on in the conversation, we talked about this idea of, of getting context. And maybe one way you could do that was, you know, looking at your thermal imagery and, and optical imagery of, of the same scene and using that to get context. So that makes perfect sense to me. Are there any other data sets out there that would lend themselves naturally to working with thermal imagery where, where you could see like the, the synergy between this data set over here and the thermal imagery that you're collecting? Yeah, I mean, thermal is an interesting band because typically, especially for the mid-wave infrared, you need to cool the detector. So it's not often captured, actually. If you compare it to like hyperspectral images, they would capture a very broad spectrum of wavelengths, but not even uh, at the mid-wave infrared. So it could be very complementary in terms of identifying particular kind of materials once you fuse those different data sets. The other thing we're going to be doing is imaging at night, and the only other people that are doing that are SAR constellations so i'd see there's probably a natural uh, a synergy between the two data sets there and the other thing we can do is we have high resolution but as we've already discussed there are other satellites out there with lower resolution but more of a back catalog of data you know landsat and modus so it might be that combining the higher resolution data with the historical record can actually generate additional insights oh, that is a great idea I, I never thought of that is that something that is going to be sort of first on the drawing board in, in terms of projects to work on, or is, is that going to sort of come later on? Mm, we'll have to see. I mean, <laughs> we will be launching in about eight months' time, and honestly, I can't really predict exactly where we're going to be focusing at that time. It would probably be driven by our biggest commercial customers and the, the problems that they are working on. I expect we will also partner with academia and other organizations that you know study the Earth from a more scientific point of view and potentially either we'll do the analysis or we'll partner with another organization. They'll take our data and do the analysis. But I certainly see that as a featuring in our workload relatively early on. So, so my last question here for you, but before I let you go, is 
Are there any specific tools specific to thermal imaging, or do you just sort of make use of the broader palette of um, computer vision tools that, that are out there? And I guess what I'm getting at, it seems to me that SAR has a very specific set of tools that, that are used in, in that domain. And, but, but optical, at least in my understanding, has, can sort of pull from the, this, this broader category of tools from, from c- computer vision. Is that the same situation for thermal imagery, or do you have special tools for, for dealing with thermal images? There are, as you mentioned, like special tools for dealing with SAR imagery. There's not really anything out there for dealing with the kind of thermal imagery that we've been capturing. So for the most part, we've been developing those tools in-house and we've had a significant effort around the sort of calibration and standardization of thermal imagery, which obviously is tied in with our product. For the most part, I personally am working with the standard like open source libraries for vision using Python, so OpenCV, uh, NumPy, PyTorch, uh, all pretty much bread and butter for me. Robin, th- thank you very much for your time. I, I really appreciate you taking the time to, to walk us through this, tell, teach us all a little bit about thermal imagery and, and what the future might hold. There'll be people listening to this and thinking, well, how can I get a hold of this guy? How can I reach out to him? How can I continue this conversation? Where, where can they go to do that? Are there any links we can send people to? Are there any resources we can share with folks? Yeah, I'm, I'm very active on both Twitter and LinkedIn. And I've actually created a, a group all around satellite image deep learning on LinkedIn, and that'd be a great place to connect and you know to to share some of the material around deep learning we've actually obviously got a company website that's got some some pages just discussing thermal imagery and its characteristics and that would definitely be recommended further reading on that topic i'm looking forward to getting to some in person events uh, now that covid is behind us and connecting in person wonderful um i will i'll dig up some of those links that you mentioned and i'll put them in the episode in the show notes of, of this podcast episode so thanks again for your time i really enjoyed talking with you thanks Daniel. it's been a pleasure to be on so i really hope you enjoyed that episode with robin cole right at the end there he mentioned a few different links and a few different resources and places uh, you, you could reach out to them but i think the best place to reach out to him would be at robmarkcole.com so this is his website and i'll put a, a link to that in the show notes from there you can find his Twitter profile, you can find his LinkedIn account. There's there's links to Satellite View, which is the company he's currently working at. And of course, and from here, you'll also be able to find the LinkedIn group that he's created and the GitHub repository all around satellite imagery and, and deep learning. And speaking of resources for Earth observation, check out GeoAwesomeness and the EO Hub, the Earth Observation Hub. So again, this is another great place to go if you're interested in Earth observation. They're curating a a bunch of great resources over there and it's a a constantly evolving project. So it'd be well worth stopping by from time to time to, to see what they've got. As usual, there'll be links to all these things in the show notes of this episode, but you can also just search for GeoAwesomeness EO Hub, Earth Observation Hub, and, and you'll find it that way as well. So we talked a little bit about heat islands during this conversation. And I think if you're interested in heat islands and Earth observation, you might really enjoy a podcast episode called Eyes on Earth, episode 55, Urban Heat Islands of New York. And in this episode, they, they focus on using Landsat data to pinpoint hotspots in New York City. Okay, that's it for me. That's it for this episode of the Mapscaping Podcast. I'll be back again next week. I, I hope that you'll take the time to join me then. Bear in mind, we, we create a lot of resources over at mapscaping.com as well. That's worth checking out from time to time. And if you want to get in touch with me for whatever reason, that would be a great place to start. Okay, I'll see you again next week. Bye.